Hi there. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 72, I believe it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of September 6th to 12th, 2012, and I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next um, eh, almost half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things important to me, I think deserve to be important to you as well. Uh, as always, any comments, questions, reactions, whatever, uh, should be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Uh, and if you didn't catch that, uh, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here a couple of times during the show. Uh, and you can get the email address from there. I do answer my email, but as I always say, that uh, I can be a little slow about it. So, you know, cut me a little slack, be a little patient. I do ask, though, that if you send me email, please include something in the subject line like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that so I know it's not spam. Okay, with those weekly introductions out of the way, uh, this week I'm going to start with um, some good news. I always like to start with good news where I can. An outfit called the Colorado Personhood Coalition a few years ago got on the ballot in Colorado a proposed amendment to the state constitution that would essentially ban all abortions, even in the cases of rape or incest. Uh, it lost by a margin of about three to one. Undeterred, a year or two later, that same coalition got essentially the same question on the ballot again, and again it lost by about three to one. Undeterred, they tried again this year. But apparently this year, the response of Coloradans was, what, you again? The uh, petition did not even get enough valid signatures to make it onto the ballot this time. So apparently the people of Colorado are getting a little fed up with this. Now, the anti-freedom forces are, of course, uh, appealing this decision by the Colorado um, Secretary of State's office. Uh, but even if they do manage to get the question onto the ballot, this year's question which would not only ban abortion, even in the cases of rape and incest, but would effectively outlaw uh, uh, um, some fertility treatments and stem cell research. Um, well, early polling would have it going down by a better than two to one margin. So uh, there's another area I've been talking about recently, moving on from there. Um, I've been talking about these voter ID laws. Uh, a number of states have passed these laws uh, that they disproportionately affect people who are normally thought to be more liberal constituencies, like the young, uh, students, um, the poor, and minorities. And uh, they also uh, uh, impact the elderly. And while the elderly are often not thought of as a particularly liberal constituency, the fact is on matters like Social Security and Medicare, which the both of which the right wing would love to destroy. Uh, on those matters, yeah, they vote right to the liberals right down the line. So the effects of these uh, laws are to disproportionately impact more liberal voters. Um, well, there are actually a couple of bits of good news on this front. One is that there was a, a Texas law which required a, a photo ID. Uh, the... Um, on August 29th, a three-judge panel of a federal appeals court in Washington ruled that the law imposes strict, unforgiving burdens on the poor and struck it down. Uh, and the day after that Texas decision, a district federal court in Ohio ruled that the state had to restore uh, early voting for the last weekend, the last three days before the election. The thing is, that had been the law since after the 2004 election, but this year the state tried to limit that option simply to uh, members of the military and to citizens living abroad. Uh, the judge in the case found the change arbitrary and said that the state had shown no compelling reason why those two groups should be treated differently than other people in the state. Also, there's a, um, uh, a, a case in South Carolina. Now, because of its uh, history of racial discrimination, election laws in South Carolina, any changes in those laws have to be approved by the Department of Justice. 
and South Carolina passed one of these obnoxious voter photo ID laws, and the DOJ struck it down as discriminatory, and South Carolina has now sued the federal government in federal court to get this overturned. So the case is going on now, and um, it's not going too well for South Carolina. Uh, one witness, uh, she, her name is uh, Marcy Andino. She's the election commission, she's the executive director of the election commission in South Carolina. She admitted that the law could not prevent voter fraud and that in fact she did not know of a single legitimate case of voter fraud. Um, of, uh, I should say of in-person voter fraud, which is what these laws are supposedly about. Another witness is this guy, Alan Clemens. He's a state representative. He was the main sponsor of the law. He admitted under cross-examination that he had no proof of anyone casting ballots fraudulently. He was also presented with evidence that at one time he was going around giving out bags of peanuts with cards attached that said, Stop Obama's, Obama's nutty agenda and support voter ID, which pretty clearly shows an intended connection between voter ID laws and political gain for one side. Um, now, unfortunately, however, not all the news uh, on this is good. Um, unfortunately, if perhaps not surprisingly, um, the Ohio Secretary of State, his name is John Husted, he announced uh, Tuesday that the state was not going to comply with the federal court ruling to make those extra three days of early voting available. Uh, he said it, the state's not going to do that until an appellate court rules on the matter. And frankly, my suspicion is that what they're hoping to do is to delay a decision on this until the point where people have become so accustomed to the idea that... Um, that uh, they're not going to be able to vote, to do early voting on those three days, that even if the state loses, which it should, it won't make any difference. It'll have the same impact. Remember, this is the state, Ohio, this is the state that recently tried to expand hours for early voting in heavily Republican counties and restrict them in heavily Democratic counties. And here's the other thing. Voter ID laws these voter ID laws, these are not the only way that right-wingers are using to try to restrict people's access to the voting booth. Uh, one other way is to create roadblocks to getting registered to vote in the first place. Example is Florida. Florida, last year, Florida put new restrictions on voter registration drives. These restrictions were so extreme that even the League of Women Voters gave up trying to do voter registration in Florida. And the thing is, if you don't think that has a political impact, all right, check this. I want you to bring up graph one. Graph one. Now, this is a bar graph, which I'll tell you, it's not really to scale. It's just to give the idea. Uh, but you notice this, what this is, this is a graph of new uh, party, uh, party voter registration in Florida in the year leading up to the 2004 presidential campaign. Um, that is, the period covered was actually from July 1st, 2003 to July 31st, 2004, so the 13-month period. You can see in that period there are about 159,000 new voters who registered as Democrats and about 112,000 registered as Goppers. Okay, graph two. This is the new voter, this adds the new voter registration in the 13 months leading up to the 2008 presidential campaign. Now, not surprisingly, considering all the enthusiasm that there was around the 2008 Barack Obama campaign, uh, there are a good number of new Democratic Party registrations. The, re the Republicans, the Goppers, they got roughly the same number that they had gotten in, in the previous cycle. Between 2008 and now, Florida instituted its restrictions on voter registration drives. Bring up graphic three. This is the result. In the year leading up to this year's campaign, the, the Goppers again got about, within the same ballpark, the number of registrations they got in leading up to 2008 and 2004. But as you can see, new Democratic Party registrations crashed to 11,000. 
considerably less than a tenth of what they had gotten before, about, about a twentieth of what they'd gotten before. The point is these laws work. These laws to restrict access to the voting booth, they work. They have real world consequences. They really do impact the ability of people, or to be more exact, the ability of people who the right wing does not want to be able to vote. It really does impact the ability of those people to be able to vote. These laws are not just an annoyance. They are not merely misguided. They are part of a deliberate, conscious campaign to deny the vote to certain groups of people in order to create a permanent structural bias in our electoral system in favor of the right wing and its corporate backers and the 1% who own them. That matters. Okay. From there, we're moving on to our uh, frequent feature, the Clarabelle Award. Clarabelle Award, given as needed for acts of meritorious stupidity. Now, I've already mentioned this week's dishonoree. It's Alan Clemens, the South Carolina state legislator uh, who was the main sponsor of South Carolina's uh, photo ID law. In his testimony in the suit over the law, Clemens was presented with the text of an email that was sent to him by a supporter. The email said, and I'm quoting, I don't buy that garbage that if a poor black person or an elderly one, that these people won't be able to get one. You listen to that big racist Clyburn and her Putlian talk, and they make it sound like these people are too stupid to get one. Now, um, the racist Clyburn is the African-American and civil rights hero representative James Clyburn. Dick Harputlian is the, um, is the party chair for the Democratic Party in South Carolina. All right, this email went on to say that all the state legislature had to do was to give, I'm quoting again, a $100 bill away if you came down with a voter ID card and you would see how fast they got voter IDs with their picture. It would be like a swarm of bees going after a watermelon. Faced with this email containing, as he himself admitted, uh, more than a hint of racism, Clemens wrote back, Amen, thank you for your support of voter ID. Now, in his testimony, Clemens said his words were poorly considered. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. But here's what got me about this, and here's what really got him the award uh, for this week. When he was asked if he should have considered getting into a debate over the swarm of bees on watermelon comment, Clemens said, I didn't think it was the time nor the place to do so. Well, first off, what would be the time and place? But more to the point, you know, if Clements had said something like, well, the truth is, I didn't really look at it, didn't really register it, you know, I didn't read it that closely, it just, you know, it just registered, oh, a uh, constituent agrees with me, send thank you. And that would have sounded disingenuous, but at least it would be plausible. But by saying it wasn't the time or place to do it, uh, he's admitting that he was aware of the remark, aware of its, racist, uh, of its racist nature, and he at best deliberately ignored it if, in fact, he did not actually endorse it. Now, I'll ask again, when is the right time to challenge racism if it's not when you're faced with racism? I know one person that I won't bother asking that question. Alan Clemens, clown. All right, moving on from there. A very quick transition to uh, our regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. This one involves a uh, federal investigation. Federal authorities have announced uh, just the other day that they have dropped their investigation into abusive power uh, allegations against Joe Arpaio. He is the sheriff of Maricopa County, Arizona, and is the self-proclaimed America's toughest sheriff. The federal probe focused on his so-called anti-public corruption squad, the targets of which always seem to be people that were in some kind of conflict with Arpaio and his friends. In a uh, central case considered, Arpaio and his top ally is the former county attorney, Andrew Thomas, uh, they've been embroiled like in a three-year feud with some, uh, with some county executives uh, and some judges. 
One of those judges at one point, his name he was a Superior Court judge named Gary Donahoe. Uh, one of those judges at one point disqualified Thomas from handling an investigation into the construction of a court building, and he was going to have a special prosecutor appointed. In response to that, criminal charges were filed against Donahoe, supposedly based on an investigation by that supposed anti-public corruption squad. Now, charges were filed against him and against two county supervisors. The charges were dismissed. They were dismissed on the grounds that Thomas had filed them for political gain and to embarrass the targets. And this April, he was disbarred as a result of this. Despite being the source of the charges, Arpaio apparently is going to skate. What's more, the feds have also, as part of this, dropped investigations to allegations of misuse of county credit cards by, by his officials, uh, misspending of jail enhancement funds, other stuff. They've just dropped it. Uh, deploying the Sergeant Schultz gambit, the DOJ pointed out, uh, or insisted, quoting the DOJ statement, we do not believe the allegations presented to us are prosecutable as crimes. In other words, I see nothing. Critics wondered why, if the DOJ was so sure of that, they made this announcement at 5 p.m. on the Friday preceding a, 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 a holiday weekend with the Democratic National uh, Convention to follow immediately after. That is, at a time when this news was almost guaranteed to get the least coverage possible. Now, Arpaio's not out of the woods, or the cacti, just yet. Feds have also accused his office of a wide range of civil rights violations, including racially profiling Latinos, uh, retaliating against critics of his uh, immigration patrols, and of uh, basing those immigration patrols on racially charged uh, statements by, um, by, by individuals that don't allege any actual crimes. Meanwhile, perhaps more significantly, since it doesn't depend on the wimps at the DOJ, there is a civil suit that is brought by a group of Latinos uh, who claim that Arpaio and his deputies engage in racial profiling. But for right now, this power-hungry, self-celebrating jerk is able to strut his stuff. And that is an outrage. And we are going to take a break. And we're back. Okay, for the rest of the show, uh, anyone who watches this show could undoubtedly give you a multitude of reasons why no one should vote for Witless Romney, and so could I. But what I'm going to do for the rest of the show is give you reasons why Barack Obama does not deserve your vote. Uh, first, uh, let me dispense with a couple of reasons, two reasons why people say we should vote for him. One is the Lilly Ledbetter Act, the Equal Pay Act. Now, frankly, Barack Obama did not have a damn thing to do with getting that bill passed. It was passed in 2008, and Bush vetoed it. Everyone knew it was going to pass again in 2009. Now, he signed the bill. That's good. He did sign the bill, but he didn't have a flipping thing to do with getting it passed. Um, I mean, it's kind of like back in 1969 when the moon landing occurred, okay? It always annoyed me that it was Richard Nixon's name that was on that plaque that was left on the moon. He didn't have anything to do with the, with the Mercury program, with the Gemini program, with the Apollo program. He didn't have anything to do with any of that. He just happened to be president at the moment that, uh, that the moon landing happened. So it's his name up on that plaque that will be there for however many millennia it will take for it to go to dust. Um, it always annoyed me. And in the same way, this annoys me. Barack Obama does not deserve any of the credit for passing the Lilly Ledbetter Act. All right, the other one, and this one particularly gripes me, is uh, the claim, he ended the war in Iraq. No, he didn't. In the fall of 2008, before the election, the Iraqis forced George Bush to accept a timetable for the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq by the end of 2011. All Barack Obama did was carry out that timetable. He did not create it, he did not advance it, he did not produce it, uh, he didn't change it, except that they did try to change it. They tried to pressure the Iraqis into allowing U.S. forces to stay after the end of 2011, and they failed. 
That's why the troops are out. That's why the war is over. Not because of anything Barack Obama did, but because of what the Iraqis made George Bush do and what Barack Obama failed to do. All right. Now, several reasons why you should not vote for Barack Obama. One. He has presided over a massive expansion of government surveillance of our personal lives. Uh, William Binney, he's a former technical director at the National Security Agency, said during a panel discussion at a conference in July that the NSA was indeed collecting emails, Twitter writings, internet searches, and other data belonging to Americans and indexing it. There is today being built in Bluffdale, Utah, a $2 billion center designed uh, it's an NSA building. It's being designed to intercept, decipher, analyze, and store vast swaths of information across all communications channels, foreign and domestic. It should be up and running in about a year. This, in fact, is the realization of the Total Information Awareness Program that uh, came out under the Bush administration and was killed because of the howling about privacy from the now silent liberals. Um, already operating in several cities right now is, some, is a system called Trapwire. This is designed to pick up and transport to a fortified central database all information it gathers where it will be combined with other intelligence for the purpose of, quoting a press release, identifying patterns of behavior that are indicative of pre-attack planning. Shades of minority report where now you get arrested for things you haven't even done yet. Two. He is engaged in an unprecedented attack on whistleblowers. The Obama administration has already charged six people under the Espionage Act for alleged leaking of classified information. All the past presidencies in the entire history of the act, dating back to 1917, did that in three cases. Three, closely related to that, he has abused secrecy. Uh, he claimed to be an advocate of government transparency. He promised the most transparent government ever but instead has established the most secretive administration of modern times. Uh, major programs and policies, especially as related to the use of force, are conducted without public debate or often even knowledge. He has done this more thoroughly and effectively than anyone might have imagined. Four, he has waged a secret wars in Yemen and Somalia and has dramatically expanded the drone war in Pakistan. Before Barack Obama came into office, there had been one U.S. military strike in Yemen. During his administration, there have been as many as 110. Under George Bush, there were 50 drone strikes in Pakistan. Under Barack Obama, there have been 294. Under George Bush, there were 429 casualties from those drone strikes. Under Barack Obama, there have been 2,133. Five. He has failed to prosecute war criminals and torturers. After coming into office loudly declaring nobody is above the law, Obama immediately set out to actively shield the war criminals of the Bush administration, including those who tortured prisoners, not only from criminal prosecution, but from congressional investigations and private civil suits as well. The final page of this disgusting chapter was written on August 30th. The DOJ announced that they were dropping investigations into the only two cases uh, relating to the torture regime where it even considered prosecution. Those cases both involved detainees who were essentially killed by their interrogators, one by freezing, one by asphyxiation. There were only two of the over 100 such deaths that occurred uh, in custody. And these are the only two that even got to the point of being investigated. Torture, it seems, according to the Obama administration, is not a crime. Six, he has engineered the widest, most serious expansion of executive authority ever to a degree Bush and Cheney could only have dreamed about. He claimed he was against the Patriot Act, but when it came up for renewal, he endorsed it. Under the National Defense Authorization Act, which I've talked about several times, which he signed, he has the power to indefinitely detain without trial or charge any person, including American citizens taken on American soil, anyone he, in his own unreviewable, unchallengeable judgment, decides is giving uh, substantial support to some associated force of terrorism, whatever that means. 
He has, the authority, he has also asserted the authority to kill anyone, including American citizens on foreign soil, if, again, he, in his unquestionable, unchallengeable, unrevealable judgment, decides that person is a terrorist. Seven, he has beaten the war drums against Iran, talking about red lines and staging massive military maneuvers in the Persian Gulf. This despite the fact that U.S. officials will admit, when you ask them directly, that there is no evidence that Iran is trying to build a nuclear weapon. And bluntly, even if it were, what gives us the right to attack them in response? Why do we get to decide who has nuclear weapons and who don't, who doesn't? Right now, the United States is sitting on what is still the world's most destructive nuclear arsenal. We are not in a high moral ground here. This goes beyond tough talk. On Obama's orders, the U.S. released Stuxnet. This is a computer worm into Iran's nuclear facilities to destroy its centrifuges. This, according to the Pentagon, this kind of cyber attack is an act of war. Eight, he has failed to prosecute Wall Street crooks. In fact, the administration specifically refused to follow up on a criminal referrals from the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. The bankers got away with theft, with wire fraud, bank fraud, loan fraud, securities fraud, commodities fraud. Millions, while well, millions of Americans lost their life savings and their homes. The banks are right back at the same rigged game that got us in this mess. The too big to fail banks are even bigger. And Obama's plan to deal with this is to, is to replace Tim Geithner with Erskine Bowles. Nine, while he's all tough and macho and private and dealing with whistleblowers, when it comes to political, uh, political debate, he's a wimp. He backs down to the goppers at every turn, often even before the debate begins. Consider the, um, uh, the, the health care bill. We, uh, we never got a public option, which wouldn't be that good compared to a National Health Service, but still, it would be a lot better than what we got. Why didn't we? Because Obama gave it away. He announced he was giving that away even before the debate started. Um, another, even starker case, is the stimulus package. Obama was told by his Council of Economic Advisors that the stimulus package needed to be about $1.8 trillion in order to actively help the economy. They said, oh, we can't get that passed, and eventually it got cut to $800 billion, which means that we got a stimulus less than half of what they knew was needed, and we still have the, the weakest economic recovery in modern times, in how many decades, because the Obama administration could not be bothered to fight for something better. Finally, 10, get it through your thick skulls. Barack Obama wants to cut Social Security. He wants to cut Medicare. Um, and in fact, he has groused and whined that he doesn't get enough credit for being so willing to cut them. All right, so there you got it. You got 10 good reasons why Barack Obama does not deserve your vote. You already know Witless Romney doesn't deserve it. So there you are. And if I've depressed you, welcome to reality. That's it for me. I'm done. I'm out of here. We will see you next week. Um, you just have <laughs> the best week you possibly can. And... Um, We'll see you next week.